Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. We have been working through the life of Joseph through this summer series, and the story starts with a 17-year-old, roughly speaking, a little full of himself, which is understandable because he's his dad's favorite. His dad makes it clear. And so Joseph is a dreamer, we find out, even as a young man. God gives him a dream that is bigger than he could possibly understand at that moment, right? His brothers, though, are jealous of him. They see what's going on. They see what's happening in his life. And so they're jealous and they conspire to get rid of him. They fake his death and they sell him into slavery in Egypt. This is a real scenario in ancient times that could have happened, right? Joseph ends up having to serve in the house of the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Okay, so like the special forces, he's the head of this. His name is Potiphar. But there as he's serving, Joseph finds success and he finds favor and he ends up in charge of the entire affairs of this man Potiphar. So things are going okay. But then Joseph is falsely accused, right? He's imprisoned. And there in prison, we see Joseph begins to find favor as well. And he ends up administering, administrating the entire prison. So he's, he's in there, but he's also running the affairs of things. And so when two of Pharaoh's servants land in prison as well, Joseph helps them out, hoping that one of those would be able to speak on his behalf. But that guy, the cupbearer, the guy who uh, literally was the waiter to the king, Pharaoh, that guy actually gets out but forgets about Joseph. We talked about that last week as well. So Joseph ends up spending two more years in prison. Okay? Now, it's at this time that we're going to kind of pick up the story here today. What happens is while Joseph is still languishing in prison, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has two dreams in the same night, and they are troubling to him. Okay? Now, in ancient times, dreams were considered harbingers of good or bad things, right? And so there was a lot of weight placed on this, and Pharaoh, for whatever reason, believed that these two dreams had a great significance. And in the first dream, he's standing by the Nile River. Okay, this is the source of of everything in Egypt. And in his dream, seven cows come up out of the river. They're fat, and they're healthy. And then seven other cows, all skin and bones, come up out of that river and they stand next to the fat healthy ones then they eat the fat healthy ones (laughs) right so the skinny cows eat the eat the fat cows and now i just want want to take note here cows generally have an aversion to steak okay so so if your cows are eating meat you need to pay attention. That's why I think Pharaoh is looking at this going, wait, there's something off about this dream. The cows are eating meat. And so it's almost as if God is trying to get Pharaoh's attention, saying, you need to look at this. Something isn't right about this. If our kids are depressed and hopeless, I'm going to fix this because it may be cause for some humor later on. If our kids are depressed and hopeless, we need to pay attention, right? If, if marriages are crumbling or suffering, we need to pay attention. If people are anxious and angry all the time, we need to pay attention. That's what I feel like is this. Pay attention because in this moment, I think God is saying, Hey, Pharaoh, you need to pay attention because I would like to shift things a little bit. I would like to offer my help. In this moment 
That's, that's what's happening here. Something is, it needs to shift. And God's plan, even for the king of a pagan nation, of an unbelieving nation, God's plan is to show mercy. Pay attention. I would just say this. We are not here today to play church. We don't have time to play church. We're not here to play church. We're here to pay attention. Because the scenarios that I described are real life scenarios right now. And it's up to us to pay attention and say, God, what is it that you would speak to us in this moment? How are we needing to be used by you in this moment? Pharaoh, he wants to understand the meaning of these dreams. And so he sends, the story goes, he sends for all the sages, all the wise men in Egypt, his, his key guys, but no one knows what they mean. You think, well, you don't think somebody would offer an explanation? And I, I think maybe they were smarter than to try and do that if they weren't sure. No one knew what this dream meant, but all the while that Pharaoh is interrogating his wise men, who is standing next to him but his cupbearer? And the cupbearer says, after a while, he says, um, excuse me, excuse me, Pharaoh, my bad, but... There's a Hebrew slave who I met in prison. Remember that time when you threw me in prison for a few days? And and this Hebrew has a gift for interpreting dreams. I was supposed to tell you about him, but I forgot. And the king says, wasn't that like two years ago? And the cupbearer says, yeah, my bad. (laughs) So this is where we pick it up. Genesis 41. I'm going to ask you to stand because we, this is our habit to stand for the reading of the word. I've covered a lot of ground in the story, but as you can tell, there's a lot of story to be told. They did a great story. Beginning at verse 14, verse 14, it says, Pharaoh at once sent for Joseph. They, they brought him on the run from the jail cell. He cut his hair, put on clean clothes, and came to Pharaoh. I dreamed a dream, Pharaoh told Joseph. Nobody can interpret it. But I've heard that just by hearing a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered, not I, but God. God will set Pharaoh's mind at ease. So then we'll skip through. Uh, Pharaoh tells the, Joseph all about the dreams that he had about cannibalistic cows and the same thing with grain. Fat grain, skinny grain, eats the grain. Not supposed to happen. Genesis 41, verse 28. It says, Joseph replies to Pharaoh and says, God is letting Pharaoh in on what he's going to do. Seven years of plenty are on their way throughout Egypt. That's the seven fat cows. But on their heels will come seven years of famine, leaving no trace of the Egyptian plenty. As the country is emptied by famine, there won't even be a scrap left of the previous plenty. The famine will be total. The fact that Pharaoh dreamed the same dream twice emphasizes God's determination to do this and to do it soon. So... Pharaoh needs to look for a wise and experienced man and put him in charge of the country. And then Pharaoh needs to appoint managers throughout the country of Egypt to organize it during the years of plenty. Their job will be to collect all the food produced in all the good years ahead and stockpile the grain under Pharaoh's authority, storing it in the towns for food. This grain will be held back to be used later during the seven years of famine that are coming on Egypt. This way, the country won't be devastated by the famine. This seemed like a good idea to Pharaoh and his officials. And then Pharaoh said to them, isn't this the man that we need? Are we going to find anyone else who has God's spirit in him like this? Verse 41, so Pharaoh commissioned Joseph, I'm putting you in charge of the entire country of Egypt. Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his finger and slipped it on Joseph's hand. He outfitted him in robes of the best linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He put the second-in-command chariot as at his disposable Air Force Two. And as he rode, people cheered for him. Joseph was in charge of the entire country of Egypt. Pharaoh told Joseph, I'm Pharaoh, I'm king, but no one in Egypt will make a single move without your stamp of approval. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would add your blessing to the reading and the hearing of your word today. We want our hearts to be like good soil for your word to fall on, that it would bear good fruit in our lives, the fruit of faith and obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. Okay, turn to somebody before you're seated and tell them, I got next. You can be seated. Remember that when 
be ready, people be playing on the court, whatever else, and you can call that. I got next. <laughs> I got next. That's, a, that's, a, that's the way it is with our kids already. They're already established. My kids, you know, it's usually more about the iPad or whatever else. If there's one of them that's getting to use the iPad right now for a little bit, the other one, I got next. <laughs> now, li- listen, I want to talk to you about this because this is, this is a moment here for you and I when we can see in Joseph's story something that's powerful and important for us. Joseph has been his entire life, all the ups and downs, in some sense, it's been leading up to this moment when he can stand up and say, I got next. It's my time and it's my turn. But there are a few things that I feel like we ought to pay attention to when we consider what happened with Joseph and what I believe God wants to do in our lives as well. And the first one is this. We need to know a few things. Number one, God develops his finest through faithfulness. I was, I am, the youngest of five children, okay? Now, I like to say because there is barely any, you know, with the first child, there's a lot of pictures. The second child, a few pictures. The third child, still a few pictures. The fourth child, ah, uh, they're not sure. The fifth child, they're just like, whatever. We, didn't e- we weren't even planning on this anyway. There's barely a record of my childhood. I, I, I like to say I am the perfect candidate for the CIA. As if in a meeting sometime, as a, as a younger person, I could have sat down with someone from the CIA and they would say, listen, before we can make you a spy, we're going to need to scrub any record of your childhood existence. And then I could pull out like three pictures and tear them up and be like, done. It's, it's not like that now, okay? Nowadays, every child has a library of photos and videos from every moment, both important or not, right? Our, our son, Asher, is, is walking now, and I already have like 84 videos of his first few steps. Here's a, his first few steps on a Tuesday. Here's his first few steps on a Thursday. You know, it's just like there's no end to it, and it's not because... We love our kids more than my parents love me. At least that's what I tell myself. (laughs) It's because it's so much easier today to record those moments through photos and videos, right? Because back in the day, I I just hate that I'm going to be saying that all the time, the older that I get. Back in the day, though, some of you guys remember what it was like when there were only film cameras, right? Right? Raise your hand if you know what it was like to have a flash bulb, right? The little thing that sat on the top and would twist around and would pop, you know, like almost alarmingly so with smoke and stuff like that. It was a fire hazard in the making. And, and then and you would have a roll of, of film in your camera that had either 12 or 24 or 36 photos, right? Today, when I take one picture, it's like a burst of 36 photos right there, right? But then it was like you would, you would have to ration your photos out. And then once you, once you got it all, you would click it and, you know, like have to advance the film over there. And then when you were done with that roll of your 24 photos, you would make sure it was all the way done and you would take it out and you would take the, the film to get developed somewhere. And then in a few short days... That's how it was. Can you believe? I mean, it's like amazing to it, We have no patience for this today. But in a few short days, you would drive back to that place and pick up your 24 photos to see how bad they really were. And they were never good. This one was a thumb. This one was like the side of somebody's face. And it was all, you know, like super bright from the flashbulb. It was... It was rare. I mean, if you got one good photo out of those 24, you were feeling like a champ. The process for developing that film was very specific, right? Uh, you know, there was, there, there was an image that had been burned onto the negative of that film, right? And, and if it was exposed prematurely to light... If you made the mistake of taking that roll of film out and it got exposed prematurely to the light, then it would be ruined. It would be done. Part of the process was then when when they would take that film and begin to develop it in a dark room, it was the careful timing of when and how it could actually be exposed to light. Joseph is a no name. He is a nobody. Nobody. Now, we're reading his story 
But you have to know this. At this moment in time, he is insignificant. Utterly insignificant. Long gone are the days when he would strut around in his multicolored coat that his dad had given him. Thirteen years have passed and he is unknown and forgotten. The only clothes that he's had for the past 13 years would have been, would have been the servant, servant's clothes or the prison grays. But God has been developing him in the darkness. God has been developing him in obscurity. And all this time, Joseph has been practicing. He said, what are you, what are you talking about practicing? All this time, Joseph has been administrating the estate of Potiphar. He's been managing people, stewarding resources, balancing the books. You name it, he was in charge of the, all of the affairs of this man's uh, probably considerable estate. He has been practicing on it. And then he is literally a bureaucrat. He's, he's, he's practicing administrating what's going on in this, in this government institution, well, that he's also a, a prisoner in, but now he's been practicing through that time, learning how to administrate in that stuff. He's been interpreting dreams, right? He's been doing all of this. He's been working on stuff and everything that he's been working on is stuff that actually doesn't pertain to him. Think about that. He has been faithful this entire time with all the things that don't belong to him. All the while, Joseph thought that he was working. But we know, as we read a story, that God was working in him. And God is developing him. And God is saying, Joseph, I want to teach you how to deal with these things that do not belong to you. To be sure that you can be trusted. I will not shine a light on you until you can praise me when you are overlooked. Until you can praise me when you are forgotten. I will not shine a light on you until you learn how to be faithful with that which does not belong to you. When no one else is looking. There was a man who was uh, responsible for an incredible move of God in mainland China. God used him in a mighty way, and probably so many of the seeds that he so, has, has sown have been used to create, have, have been used to um, impact that nation for the gospel uh, for many years. His name was Hudson Taylor, and here's what he said. He said, a little thing is a little thing, but faithfulness in a little thing is a big thing. Do you see today, all this time, God has been developing Joseph. So Joseph's trials have been training him. Uh, you know, all this time, everything Joseph has been walking through, all of those trials have, have been nothing more than preparation for him. Do you believe that God is able to use every circumstance in your life to shape and to refine you and to prepare you? That's a big question for you to think about. Do you know, do you believe in your heart that your troubles are actually just training you? Do you trust that your sorrows are the seeds of something greater. Those who sow in tears, the Bible says, will reap with shouts of joy. And it became apparent to me, this language has been important to me over the years because I like to think that as those who are owned by God, who have committed ourselves to His purposes in our lives, we don't just cry tears. We don't just shed tears. We sow tears. And we... we those tears may fall, but after a time, those, we realize that God has been using even the sorrows in our lives as the seeds of some greater blessing that he wants to bring to and through us. Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. So, it's important that you understand today. God develops his finest through faithfulness. Secondly, God's plan is custom made for you. I'm so glad that he's here today that I can talk about him. Man, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a lot of years ago, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. Um, I was traveling with my friend David, and 
As we frequently had experienced this in some of the, the trips that we were taking, I think we had gone to do uh, some missions um, work with, with a, a friend in India and these long haul flights that we would have to take 12, 14 hours in coach class. I mean, you would do just about anything to get up to that area in the front where you could lay, put your feet up and whatever. So we, we were, I, was always trying to, I was always trying to find a way to get us up there. But it, it truly, in this one particular flight, I, I remember it was on British Airways, and uh, they, we were in these seats, and I'm a normal-sized guy, I like to say. Not a small guy. <laughs> Just a normal guy, right? But Dave is really tall. He's like six foot four. That's the real thing. <laughs> So Dave, Dave, Dave was really tall, and, and you know, when we tried to get, squeeze ourselves into the seat, I was like, it was tight fit for me, but it was, it was like impossible. His knees were up against the next seat. It was really bad. You know, you always, then we'll always have some kid, you know, some three-year-old who's, you know, wants to, you know, shove that seat back into your knees for the entire flight. And so literally I called the stewardess over and I'm thinking, this is our one shot while we're, while we're getting on the plane here. I know there's some empty seats up there in the business class. And I said, excuse me, miss. My friend and I here, this is very hard for us to fit in here. And look at my, look at my friend. His, knee, his legs don't even fit here. And David knew, David knew what we were doing. Like we were on the same page and he was like. <laughs> and it, was like the, it was like, let's look as sad and as uncomfortable as we can at this moment in the hopes that they'll have compassion on us. And so she really did. She, she really felt it. She saw this is a big person and, and, you know, whatever. And so she began to, we were in the back of the plane. She began to call up to her, um, her, her uh, you know, what would you call it? A colleague up in the front of the plane, you know, the, whoever the head person was. And she was, she was like, excuse me, we have a man who literally does not fit in the seat. She, was, she kept saying li- literally. Um, we have him. And then and the, the person in the front couldn't hear. And so it was like this really, to me, it was this. I was, I was even in just jo- enjoying the moment as they're like yelling across the bay. And, and partly because I could see David was getting a little bit more embarrassed as time was going on. Because she was like, Ex- we have a man who literally cannot fit in the seat. And, and you know, trying to, trying to see if we could work it out. And we didn't make it up there. But I think they might have brought back some of the, like the, the sleeping masks or some, like, some of the amenities from there to make it easier for our flight. That's what I want you to see. Most of us have felt that experience of being squeezed into a place and into a setting where we just don't feel comfortable, right? And whether that's literally, literally in this sense, or whether that's metaphorically and figuratively speaking, I want you to see today, God's purposes are not, they're not, they're not, they they never like fit us in an uncomfortable way. They're always custom made for you and I. They're always custom fit. There's always a custom fit to what God wants to do in your life. Joseph has literally been plucked from the pit and placed in the palace. And you got to ask yourself, how does a young man from a tribe of nomads rise to be the second in all of the Egyptian empire? This is the greatest empire at that point on earth. It seems implausible. Actually, it seems impossible. But this has been God's custom-made purpose for Joseph. And we see it as we read the story. All the dramatic twists and turns in Joseph's story have been leading up to this moment when Joseph is literally an overnight success. Ephesians 2 says this, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is artistry. It's poema is the word in Greek and it has to, it's where we get the word poetry from. It's, it's his workmanship. You are his masterpiece. You are made, custom made by God, not on accident, but on purpose. God is shaping you and preparing you just like Joseph. Look at me here. Some of you balked at that when I said it. God is making you and shaping you just like Joseph. Ephesians goes on to say that God isn't just preparing the worker, but he's also preparing the work. That's what we see happening in Joseph's life. It isn't just about Joseph being a man of character. It's about God preparing everything so that it's a custom fit for him. 
Everything is being prepared for you and my, for you and me. Everything was being prepared for Joseph so that at the right moment, you and I can step up and say, okay, I got next. My turn. My time. So just recognize that. God's plan is custom made for you. Recognize that, that that's, that's the way he's operating. He develops his finest in faithfulness. But thirdly, nothing is wasted in God's development plan. I think if God were to ask us permission to begin preparing us, most of us would never say yes, right? Most of us would be like, no, thank you. But God doesn't need to wait for our permission. So some of you might say, well, it seems a bit cruel. It seems a bit cruel, right? That Joseph would have to walk through all this stuff. But is there any other way for Joseph to have been ready? Not just, I'm not just talking about the skill set that he had, which was unique to the moment, but the character that was required for him to be able to selflessly administrate this. Do you think there's any other way? And I, I think my answer to that is no, I don't think so. And so I have to ask myself, is there any other way for God to ready me for what his purposes are for me? I, I don't know. Part of this lands, part of this really hangs on the fact that I have to trust that he's smarter than me. I have to trust that God, in spite of maybe the difficulties and the trials and the troubles, that God has blessing in mind for me and through me. For Joseph, I spent 13 years in servitude and in prison. And at that moment, up until the day where he gets plucked out of the prison, he still has not seen the fruit of his obedience. Whatever dream that he had as a younger man has long since been dead. So watch this. Sometimes... God allows a dream to die so we don't love the dream more than God. Sometimes God will let things become impossible so that it can be clear that it is only God's grace and power that has brought it to pass. Joseph had a lot of loss in his life. Some moments that, that if we really put ourselves uh, in, in his place, they are devastating. To be betrayed by your own family. Listen, I'm just thinking about it. But there, there are people that will, that will spend years in therapy, years in counseling, maybe just re through the rest of their life when they experience something like this. Just that alone. To be betrayed by your family so, so profoundly. To be forced into servitude and into slavery. To be falsely accused and imprisoned. <laughs> I mean, I'm giving you the highlights every time here to be forgotten by the people. I mean, some people stew in bitterness for their whole life just because they were overlooked for that one big break. And he, I just want you to see this. It seems like everything that, every good thing that Joseph had got ripped away. But I want you to understand this today. Everything that Joseph lost, he was supposed to lose. Ooh, this is hard. Everything that Joseph lost, he was supposed to lose because God had something better in mind. Everything that Joseph had been practicing on was only supposed to be practiced. We're talking about practice? We're talking about practice here, right? Everything that Joseph was working on was beneath him, and so it had to go because God had something else in mind. Had he been successful and stayed in Potiphar's house, that would have been the end of his story. He would have died a, a very, very useful slave. Had he been successful and stayed running the prison, he would have died in prison, but been a very great bureaucrat. All of these things, he had to lose all these, this story had to move forward because had he settled on anything that was beneath him, it would have been less than what God intended for him. Listen what, to what I want to say. Here's the key for this. Don't trust in the dream. The dream that God gave to Joseph as a young man was accurate, but he couldn't trust the dream. He had to trust the God of the dream. Hold on to God, not on to the dream. Put your hope, your faith, your trust in the God who rules and who overrules. You can't yet see the good things that are on the other side of your faithfulness. 
So God never wastes our tears and triumphs. How does a sheep herder from Canaan learn to administrate a 14-year program to save a nation? That's what it was. He laid out the whole plan. 14 years. This is what we're going to have to do, Pharaoh. How does a sheep herder, how does a shepherd from Canaan learn to do that? Well, you start by administering that estate. And then that government institution like prison. Then you learn how to manage and structure and delegate and oversee. And how would Joseph have known how to do this, all, all this stuff, if it hadn't been for these unfair, unwanted experiences? Today's misery is often tomorrow's ministry. That means that even the wounds that you've taken can be used by God. They can be used by God to be a blessing. Every experience that you had when you felt like you got knocked down is actually part of God's plan to help you step up and say, I got next. It's my time. What do I mean? I mean your hurts, they create compassion in you. Your job that that you didn't love, that you just took because you needed to pay the bills, well, now you have the skills that can bless others. When you didn't know that season, when you didn't know how you were going to make ends meet, you didn't know if you could make it at all, you didn't know how you were going to get through, well, that taught you to trust God in the midst of your need. That patient endurance that developed in you throughout time, it now qualifies you to be used by God in ways that you never could before. So let's stop lamenting over what's been lost. I don't mean that we can't grieve. You know that I believe in grief. You know that I see the, the importance of that. But what I mean is, let's not live in the past and hang on to that as if God doesn't have something more for us. So, a few things that I want to encourage you today before we close. Stop saying a few things. Stop saying this. Whatever I can do isn't that important. Stop saying that. In 2010, the Blackhawks won the Stanley Cup first time in a lot of years and it was a big deal at the time and it always is a big deal but this was huge because it had been so many years and it's a huge crowds were in Grant Park and it was a cool thing because what they did is everybody in the organization was invited on stage so the players were there the president the VP all the way down to the equipment guy the equipment guy <laughs> nobody knows his, nobody ever hears about that guy right he, they were all there. They all rode the buses. They were all in the processional. Everybody was recognized and celebrated. And I want you to know, this is how it is in the kingdom of God. <laughs> there's no job that's insignificant, right? It, it, there's nothing more significant about what I'm doing with the mic in my hand compared to what somebody's doing down there with our children. I, I, actually, I actually think that that's probably a more valuable role. That's probably more celebrated in heaven than the guy that gets up here with the microphone. I, I want you to see there's nothing insignificant when you decide to be, when you reach out to somebody and say, I want to walk with you. I, I, I want to invite you to, to go through, the, to be a part of my small group or to be a part of what I'm doing. Or I'm going to stand here at the door and I'm going to smile and I'm going to welcome somebody in. And you don't know how bad that person needed to see your face warm and inviting and smiling coming into church today. You just don't know. So stop saying whatever I can do, whatever I can do, isn't that important? It is. Stop saying, I don't have what it takes to make a difference. No one's ready to be a first-time parent. Nobody feels like they've got what it takes to do that. When Ava was born, our first, uh, my, my plan, the only thing I knew, I was like, okay, so we bring her home. What do I do? Sit her on the couch and say, coffee, what do you need? What can I get for you? A sandwich? What do you... Well, that I cannot help you with, you know, like that, that idea. You know, like I didn't know, we didn't know what we were going to do, but, but this is the thing. I say this all the time. If you aren't awkward at something, then you probably aren't growing. Do not say, I don't have what it takes to make a difference. You do. Second Peter 1.3 says that he has given us, he has already given us everything we need for a godly life in Christ Jesus. So it's not that we're lacking resource from God. I'll just be honest. Let me lay it out there. It's that we're lacking the faith and the love to step out and say, I will do. I'll be faithful in this. Stop saying, how could I do something amazing for God? As they entered the promised land, Joshua stood in front of the people of Israel and he said this verse, I believe it's in chapter 2 of Joshua. And he says, commit yourselves to the Lord. And he will do amazing things. What a great, what a great 
framework. Commit yourselves to the Lord and he will do amazing things. You see, this is what I want you to see. We don't need to do amazing. We just need to do available. We do available, God does amazing. Commit yourselves to the Lord. Make yourself available. Make yourself right. Say, God, what is it that you have for me? What small thing? What big thing? Whatever it might be. Lord, I'm, I'm available to you. And then let God do the amazing. So, at the end of our story, we're left this, with, with this incredible picture. The man who has been betrayed, who has suffered unjustly, who has been forgotten, is now exalted literally he is the man at the right hand of the king that sound familiar to you (laughs) there is a dream I believe that God has put in the heart of every human being and the dream when you were made when you were formed when you were born when you were when you have grown up the dream that is driving you is this dream that i could sum up in one word life and it it doesn't it isn't particular to a culture or to a, a belief system or anything else everyone i have ever met from all over the world and from all parts and from all backgrounds they all have this dream in their heart called life so it's common to all of us and I want you to see today that dream comes from God God has put that dream in the heart of every one of us that we were made for life and life eternal even after even after 90 years we don't say oh man I'm so I love them so much but I'm just so happy to see them go it's their time we don't do that that dream is for eternal life and God has put it in our hearts. The tragedy of our human experience is that we have become disconnected from the God who gave us that dream. And when we have done that, it has brought an end. I'm talking about how every one of us, the Bible says every one of us has chosen sin and selfishness. Every one of us has chosen our own way instead of God's way. Not just in our actions, but I want you to see this deep in the core of who we are. Deep inside our hearts, there is something that's broken and needs rescuing and fixing. And so, this story of Joseph that we've been talking about, it has always been pointing us to something beyond Joseph. To someone beyond Joseph. More significant. Somebody who said, I've got next. It's my time. Not just to save a nation, but to save the whole world. The Apostle Paul wrote about him, wrote about Jesus like this. He said, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest honor, the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father, that Jesus who humbled himself, who left everything behind for your and my sake. The Bible says that God elevated him. And I want you to see today, because of what Jesus did, you and I can be restored to that dream of eternal life. Every one of us needs this today. There isn't a church, there isn't a a program, there isn't a priest, there isn't a pastor who can fix this sin problem in our hearts. It is only Jesus who can do this. Only Jesus can forgive and transform. Only Jesus who was willing to suffer and to die in our place so that we could find life. That's what I'm inviting you today. I'm going to invite everybody in the house to bow your heads for just a minute. Before we dismiss today, I want to ask you just a, a critical question. I want to ask you, if you're here today and you say, I need to be restored to relationship 
with my heavenly father, with the God who made me and who made me for himself. You say, I, I need to be forgiven of my sin and I want to trust that because of what Jesus did for me, I can receive that today. If that's you and you'd say, I want you to pray for me this morning before we go, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Just as, just as I'm talking right here, just go ahead and raise your hand so that I can pray and include you in that prayer. Amen. Is there anybody else? Thank you. The balcony, thank you. Is there anybody else? You say, I, I just need you to include me in that prayer. I need forgiveness today. I want to be restored to relationship with my Heavenly Father. I'm going to pray, and before we go today, I'm going to invite everybody in the house to make this confession with me, and just to repeat after me with a loud voice, and if you raise your hand today, I just want you to make this your prayer. I'm going to give you the words, but you bring the heart, all right? Say this, dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I could be made new. You rose from the grave to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper, and heaven is my home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.